Praise the Lord, everyone. Amen. Let's stand together and open this service. God is good. How many of you have found that to be true in your life? Amen. I'm going to open the service reading from Jeremiah 29, 11. It's a scripture that's been on my heart for a few weeks now. Can't get away from it. And it simply says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. Wherever you're at, whatever you're going through, God knows exactly where you're at. He knows exactly where you're going. And he's taking care of it even if you can't see it. Amen. Let's open this service with prayer. God, we're so thankful to be able to come together and worship you, to be able to come into this house and lift your name up, Jesus. We ask for you to inhabit the praises of your people. Visit with us, God, with your holy presence, Lord Jesus. Put your anointing on everything that's done this morning, every word that's said, every song that's sung, God. Let your anointing and your presence rest in this house this morning. And we'll give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. Amen. Amen. He's so good, isn't he? He's so good. Amen. When I was growing up, we're going to go way back this morning. This, is, this was an almost every Sunday morning song. And it was just on my heart this week, so we're going to sing it. Well, once like a bird in prison I dwell.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. Amen. Sorry, I guess I don't know what's going on. <laughs> All right, let's glorify him right now.
get your prayer. We want you. We oh, he dwells in the praises you. of his people.
Come on, can we clap our hands to the Lord one more time this morning? Hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. It feels good to be in God's house, in God's presence, lifting up the name of the Lord together. I'm so glad to have each and every one of you here with us in the house of the Lord this morning. Thank you for all those that are joining us online. And we want to take a moment right now before we go any farther to pray for needs. There are many that are sick uh, here in our CTK family and those that have uh, urgent needs request. And so we're going to name some names, and then if you have a need, I invite you to join with us. Just lift up your hand. Normally, as is our, our custom in times past, we would have prayer for the sick right here, and everybody would come down, but because of the circumstances right now, we're not doing that. However, God's name is just as powerful as it's always been. Amen. Amen. And uh, this is alluded to in the New Testament when the centurion comes to the Lord and says, you don't even have to come to the house. Just speak the word only. Amen. And it's going to be done. And so we're going to call the name of the Lord today over several individuals we're praying for. Continuing prayer for Brother Roy Kessler, who's recovering from COVID with the virus. We're continuing prayer for Mother Hurt and the Hurt family, Marsha and Monica and Decal, they need a healing touch in their body. Sister Decal went to the hospital late last evening and they have uh, said that she has pneumonia. And so we need to plead the blood of Jesus right now upon that situation, that circumstance. Pray for our good missionaries, the Townsleys, who are on their way to Germany and at the last moment have been denied entrance into the nation there and uh, this is what they've been laboring for those of you that have been around you know their story but god can work it out and so they're asking us for prayer he was texting me this morning and we are praying for them there's other needs all around the world but right here if you have a need in your life would you just lift up your hand amen maybe just put a note on and say hey pray for me got a special request and god is able right now would you lift up these names that we've said can you plead the blood right now, Lord, in Jesus' name? We thank you for being a mighty God, Lord, for being a God that shows yourself so strong and so gracious and so mighty in our life. I speak the name of Jesus today, God, over each and every needed situation, God, every unspoken, every spoken today, God. I pray you cover Brother Kessler, God, and Mother Hurt, Lord, and the Hurt family and household. Sister Marcia and Sister Monica, I pray today, God, that your anointing be upon Sister DeCal Hurt. We rebuke this pneumonia, this infirmity, God. I pray in the name of the Lord, keep your people, Lord, today in Jesus' name. Let your ministering angels, let your healing touch, God, be felt right now, Lord. I thank you for your safety. I thank you for your faith. I thank you for your trust, God. Lord, we put our hope in you today, Lord, in Jesus' name. For every need right now, God, we're going to cast it down at your feet. And we're going to give you victory, God. We're going to give you praise for victory. We're going to give you thanks, God, today for healing in the name of the Lord. Come on, let's just thank you. God, you are a prayer answering God. You are faithful. Hallelujah, Lord. We love you today. Hallelujah, Lord. We bless your name. We magnify your name. Thank you, Lord, for your strength and your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for every blessing. Hallelujah. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in the house. Come on, somebody, just a little longer. Give the Lord praise and thanksgiving. Come on. The healer's in the house today. The way maker's in the house today. Hallelujah, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. Right now, in the name of the Lord, have your way. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And the church said amen. Amen, amen, amen. How many know God answers prayer? Amen. How many can testify God answers prayer? Amen. What a great God. Amen. That we serve. Amen. God bless you. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord. And welcome all of our guests, all of our visitors, all our friends that are here today. It's so good to see the Nichols family all the way from California. Give them a great big welcome. Amen. 
Stevie and Amelia, so awesome to see you guys. We miss you so much. Amen, amen. And it's good to have my friend, Dr. Lyndall Anderson here at CTK today. And he's here today just visiting his daughter. But I said, well, you can't just show up and not play something for us, help us out. So he's going to do that. Why don't you turn around to somebody, just give them a wave, a Holy Ghost wave, amen, and a smile there behind that mask. God bless you, amen, as you're seated. I want Dr. Anderson to come on up here, and he's going to, amen, play something for us, amen, this morning. You can be seated. Brother Anderson, as I call him affectionately, has been a major, major influence in my life. And ever so often there's people that come along that God just puts in your life at the right time that uh, just, man, changes everything. And, of course, uh, your family's one of those. My pastor's one of those. But I was 14, 15 years old, I think. Was it 94 or 95 that you came to Indianapolis? 95. I was 15 years old. And uh, Pastor Mooney had Brother Anderson come, and, and uh, he took over the music at Indiana Bible College, the music there at Calvary Tabernacle. And he's no stranger here. He's been here with the choral and prays on many different occasions through the years, I guess you could say now. And, uh, but he influenced my life so greatly. As a young man, any of my involvement in music was largely because of him. And uh, first of all, let's just thank the Lord that he's here. What a miracle. Amen. God is a healer. God's a way maker. And probably, I don't know, it'd be, it, it wouldn't be a stretch to say that you've probably impacted uh, music, apostolic music, as much as anyone else. How many recordings or projects have you done in the last 20-some years? I mean, would you even know? Close to Close to 25 projects. Wow, that's incredible. If you uh, aren't familiar with his work, go to Spotify, go to YouTube, and just type in Indiana Bible College Choir and Chorale Praise, and you'll pull that up. Just incredible. So many original songs, so many other things. It's just absolutely amazing. But I love and appreciate his spirit, his investment in other people. And so what... What uh, he did when he came, even though he was the most talented person in the room, was he immediately started getting younger people up. And I think I was 15 years old, and you, you, you scared me to death when you came up to me and said, you're going to play for service. <laughs> and it scared me to death. It was one of the greatest things. And uh, I, I love you, sir. It's an honor to have you. We're very happy to have Caitlin here. And I know that's the reason why you came. I know really it was to see her. But we'll just pretend like you came to see me. And so, um, and, uh, so I, I just want him to, whatever he feels, play us a song, uh, him, whatever. He has many projects. And if you want to testify, you can testify as well. I don't know if that microphone is it's ready to go. All right. So give Brother Anderson a great big welcome right here at CTK. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pastor Romine. And it is a privilege to be here with you today. And, uh, and he affectionately said he called me Brother Anderson. I call them Andrew and Janelle. They're some of my kids. But I look around the room and see so many familiar faces of young people that I love and uh, uh, cherish our relationship. And it's especially good to be here today with my daughter, Caitlin. Thank you all for loving her. And uh, we can't hardly get her to come home. She loves it here. She loves her church. She loves her pastor. And that makes me happy. And I'm very happy for that. We live in a very uh, unprecedented time. And uh, I, that's a, an understatement, I guess. You know, it, and uh, um, the uh, thing that we, we must do during this time is we must lean on the word. And uh, there's a scripture that uh, of one of my, it is my favorite hymn that I'm going to play for in just a minute is based off of. And it is from Lamentations 3. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies 
that we are not consumed because of his compassion, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Aren't you thankful that every day you wake up, you've got new mercies? I don't know about you, but I need them in my life, and I'm so thankful. Great is thy faithfulness. Somebody clap your hands unto the Lord today. Hallelujah. Great is thy faithfulness. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, I was hoping you would play that song today. Amen. Stand together with me as we go to the word of the Lord this morning. 1 Samuel chapter number 6. And 
Thank you to everyone that stepped in and uh, in our absence. I know we had a tremendous time here at CTK with the Hagen family. Didn't they do an awesome job? Just great ministry. We love and appreciate, amen, the Hagen family. Thank you, Brother Sullivan. Awesome job this past Wednesday night as well, helping us out. And everyone that stepped in, amen, filled in the gap, amen. And so uh, tonight at, what time is the youth thing tonight? Six o'clock right here, the youth, uh, CTK youth will be meeting. Sister Larissa will not be here, but uh, Brother Kendall will be uh, helping out. It's going to be a fun time. So for our young people, we don't want to miss that. Let me just say too, also, you can give in the offering on your way out. Thank you so much for your faithfulness in giving. It's almost like there's not even been a pandemic. Uh, but I do want to remind you about one thing, and that is our Project Dominican. We are raising money to build a church in the Dominican Republic. And so if you want to give to that, the Lord lays that on your heart, please don't forget about that. Amen. I'm going to take you to 1 Samuel chapter number 6, and then uh, we may just uh, real quick, I know I didn't give it to them, but reference uh, Galatians chapter number 6 as well. 1 Samuel chapter 6, there's this real interesting story that takes place, and I'm going to read four verses of Scripture here, and this is when the Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of the Testimony has been taken, has been lost in battle, taken by the enemies of God, the Philistines have it, and all of a sudden there's all kinds of plagues that uh, uh, fall uh, upon the Philistines. They want to get rid of it. And so they're, they're trying to send it out. And here's what they say. They say, we're going we're gonna to make this as impossible as we can. And if the ark of God goes back to Israel, then we know that it was of God and that there's actually power in this. And so in verse 10, it says, and the men did so and two, took two milk kine or, or cattle and tied them to the cart and shut up their calves at home, and they laid the ark of the Lord upon the cart, and the coffer with the mice of gold, and the images of their emeralds, and the kind took the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh, and went along the highway, lowing as they went, and turned not aside to the right hand or the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them under the border of Beth Shemesh, and they of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. Now, this is an interesting text because you probably have no clue what we're talking about right now. That's the way King James Version is sometimes when you open up. What does this mean? But we're going to talk today, if we can, from this thought, when the glory, when God's glory returns, when God's glory returns. In Galatians chapter 6, he says this in verse 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And here it is, verse 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing. Read it with me. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Amen. It is unprecedented times. It is times like no other. And there is every temptation and every opportunity to quit, to throw in the towel, to give up. Amen. But I'm here to tell somebody now's not the time to bail out. Now's not the time to walk away. Now's not the time to miss out on what God is doing because God's glory is about ready to return. <laughs> Hallelujah. The glory of the Lord's about ready to return. Hallelujah. Can you lay your Bibles down? Let's lift our voice one more time toward heaven. Come on, would you ask the Lord to have his way today? In the name of Jesus Christ, God, today, let your anointing lead us, God, by your word and by your spirit. God, let the truth of your spirit be here today in this house. 
I pray your blessing be upon every heart, every home, every family, every household that's here today and those that are watching online. We pray this right now in your mighty name, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise one more time as you're seated today. Hallelujah. Amen. For the sake of time, allow me to condense, if you will, or paraphrase much of the story that's going on. Because what I want to cover today, I want to get to one main point that we were reading, but it's an interesting story that takes place. And it takes place over a significant amount of time. The Ark of the Covenant is the representation of the Spirit of God. The Ark of the Covenant is the representation of the glory of the Lord. It signifies the abode of God on earth. And so it had incredible significance. When God gives to Moses the tabernacle plan, it was the Holy of Holies, if you've ever heard that referred to, where the Ark of the Covenant would rest and the priest would go once a year in there to offer atonement on the Day of Atonement. And that represented the glory of the Lord. It was, it was the most restrictive place. It was the place where you had to be absolute sanctified. Everything had to be right and proper. Only the high priest, you had to be qualified to be able to interact with the presence of God at this level because if you were not right, if you were not prepared, you could not stand in the presence of God. You would die. And so there was all these restrictions and all these things. It was never God's attempt, intent rather, it was never God's intent to make himself separated from man. It was always God's intent to bring man back together with God. But there, was some, there were some things, and there are some things that have to be acknowledged. There has to be some qualifications. You cannot just approach God in your humanity, your, uh, uh, your sinfulness, your rebellion, your prideful ways, because God is holy and He is mighty. We sang about Him being a mighty God. We prayed for the sick just a few moments ago, and we spoke the name of Jesus, believing that at the name of Jesus, amen, all demons have to flee. They have to bow. Every sickness has to submit and surrender to the name of Jesus. And so we cannot just have some kind of casual attitude with God. But when you come in contact or when you approach the presence of God, it has to be on his terms. And so that's why the Bible, that's why the gospel, that's why the cross. It was God making a way for us to be able to access, access the holy, the divine, the pure, the righteous. We are unholy. Amen. We, we are not pure. And so we could not stand in his presence, but through the cross, God clothes us in righteousness. The veil was rent. It was made possible uh, for us to approach the throne of grace boldly. So today we do have access, praise God, Brother Caraway, through repentance and baptism in Jesus' name and the infilling of the Spirit of God. The glory of God comes into our life. But in the Old Testament, the ark of God symbolized the presence of God. It was everything. Israel had neglected God's commandments and God's ways. And Israel, and this isn't my sermon, but Israel comes to a place where they are wanting the blessings of God without his guidelines. They want the power of God without responsibility. Hear me today. We live in a generation. It's not new to us. It's been in every civilization of mankind throughout antiquity. We live in a generation that wants blessings and wants power and wants rights without responsibility. 
It's somebody else's fault. It's I want to be able to do, don't tell me how to live. Don't tell me what to do. I'm going to do whatever I want to do, but give me all the, the blessings and all the things. And God says, no, that's not how this works. If you obey my commandments, then I will love you and I will shower blessings on you. And, 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 and you will be greater than anyone else in the world. But if you deny me and and run away from me, I will withdraw myself from you. And so here's, here's the context of the story. They are living in such vile ways that even the high priest, even the prophet, even the man of God and his family are doing wicked things in the house of God. And the word of the Lord comes to a young servant within the Levitical household by the name of Samuel in chapters this is called 1 Samuel in chapters 1, 2, and 3. We see the story here and the word of God comes to Samuel. And the word of God tells Samuel that I'm going to judge Eli in his house. And, and Eli comes to Samuel and says, tell me what God said to you. And if you don't, I pray everything God said to you about me will be done to you. And so Samuel acquiesced. And he tells Eli that the Lord said he's going to take away your house. And Eli responds and says, the Lord is right. He has spoken right and he's going to do whatever seems good. And the Bible tells us here in chapter 3, it says, And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him in verse 21. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. The significance of that passage right there was that even though they had the Ark of the Covenant and even though they had the rituals, they were themselves, if you will, estranged from God. They no longer were obeying God. They no longer were believing God. And because of that, they no longer heard the voice of God. They no longer saw God. He no longer walked with them. He was no longer in their midst. But then the Bible talks about a young man named Samuel. And it says, and the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. It was a verse of hope. It's a message of hope that after all these years of God not speaking to his people, there was a young man. There was someone that could hear the voice of the Lord. And God again appeared. I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter how bad and dark the world is. I'm thankful that there are people today in 2020 that can still hear the voice of the Lord. Come on, would you thank God right now? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Even when great people that seem to have once had an encounter and experience with the Lord, have walked away. There's someone else that God is raising up. Amen. Let me encourage you. God is appearing again. God is moving again. God is working again. Amen. I know it may not make the news media, but the church is growing. God's kingdom is going forward. And we praise God for it. Not just here, but all over the world. And so here they are. And the enemies of God come against the so-called people of God. They're the people of God, yes, but they're not the people of God in lifestyle. It's just become a, a tradition and nothing more. They're living however they want, but in battle here here now they're in battle and Eli's sons say go grab the ark and let's take the ark in battle here is is the greatest illustration of them wanting the benefits and the blessing of God without submission, without spiritual authority, without taking responsibility for their own actions not even realizing they walk into battle with the ark of God 
And God was not with them. God did not save them. God did not protect them. God did not spare them. Even though they had the ark of God on their side. Uh, uh, Can I tell you, we've got to be careful that this does not just become form and function and tradition. Amen. We can preach the same sermons. We can sing the same songs. We can carry the same Bible. But if it's not in our heart, amen, if it's not in our spirit, if it's not in our life, amen, we're just playing church. We're just dressing up. And you won't scare one devil away. You won't won't cause one sickness to be gone. Amen. It's got to be inside of your heart. And so they march into battle. And what Samuel had prophesied to Eli comes true. They lose the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark is gone. The Philistines take the Ark. And in chapter 4, there's this passage of Scripture where the daughter-in-law of Eli, the high priest, the daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, in verse 19, was with child near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead. She bowed herself and travailed for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, neither regarded it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel. Because of the ark of God was taken and because of her father-in-law and her husband, they had died. And she's literally at this point of death. She's at this moment birthing a child into the world. It should be a moment of excitement. It should be a moment of hope. It should be a moment of great future, of posterity, another generation rising up. But instead, she's so overcome that all she could say is, where is the glory? Where is the glory? Where's the glory in my life? Where's the hope in my life? Where's the hope in this child's life? The ark of God is taken. Our husband is dead. The high priest is dead. Where is the glory? And she gave up. And the Bible says that she passed away at that moment. And her last words were, The glory is departed from Israel. Israel, for the ark of God is taken. I'm going to tell you, we are living in a day and age where many people are crying out, where is the glory? You may be watching online. Maybe you're here today and you're paying attention to what's going on, not just in the world, but maybe even it's in your own life. Maybe it has nothing to do with the pandemic and COVID. Maybe it has nothing to do with financial troubles, but something has been taken away. Something has been lost. There's no joy. There's no presence. There's no mercy. There's no love. And because of that, there's no hope. And a generation is crying out, where is the glory? It's amazing the culture of death that we are entering back into again and the, and the rise of suicides and other things that dominate our conversation and our communication and our entertainment in this present world today. It's a cry of the heart saying, where is the glory. Where is the glory? There are churches across America that used to be icons of hope, but now they've been gutted of the presence of God and they've become nothing more than political stations and social clubs. And people walk in the door and they leave unchanged and they say, Where is the glory. Where is the glory? Can I tell you, there's no hope without the glory. There's no hope without the glory. There's no future without the glory. There's no reason to live without the glory of God in our life. It is everything. You take it away 
And you're left without hope. You're left without peace. You're left without joy. You're left without future. For it's vanity to hope in yourself. It's vanity to hope in your own ability. And here she's crying, where is the glory? It becomes the name of her son, Ichabod. And she named the child Ichabod. It would signify and symbolize the, the, the culture of that day, forever he would be named where is the glory. But I'm here to tell you that in every question and every prayer, God has an answer. Yes, he does. We sing a song that says, even when I don't see it, he's working. Even when I don't feel it, he's working. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to enter into seasons in your life where you won't see it and where you won't feel it. And you're going to be tempted in your flesh to say, where is the glory? But I'm here to tell you, God is working. Chapter 5, we go on, and I hasten through the story. In chapter 5, the Philistines take the ark of God, and they also wanted to possess the power to conquer and build their own kingdom. Not They were not interested in any lifestyle. They were not interested in any kind of submission, and they bring the ark of God into the idol house of their own god named Dagon. And they set the ark next to Dagon the next morning. Dagon has fallen over on his face. We're not talking about a little figurine on a mantle. We're talking about a massive structure, a massive idol that they would have worshipped. They, they, the next day they set it back up. This was not one man or two men picking it back up. This would have been an engineering feat to them to get it back up, to put it back up. They would have put all of their devices to work to, to, to erect this thing again. And the following day, it's fallen over again, but this time with its hands <clears throat> and its head cut off, fallen off, broken off. It was God letting them know that I will not stand in the house of any other idol. I will be God alone or I won't be Lord at all. I will be Lord of all or I won't be Lord in your life. Can I tell you, be careful when you receive the Spirit of God in your life that you don't take the Holy Ghost home and put it on the mantle next to all the other things and all the other stuff in your life. No, He has to be Lord over everything. They did not do that. They took Dagon, and they, they knew they couldn't send him back up, and so they took the ark out, and immediately now plagues start falling in every city that the ark is in. And so they move the ark from one place to another city. When they take it to that city, they take it to that household, all of a sudden there were plagues that would come upon them. And people would say, no, get this thing out of here. And they'd say, okay, we're going to send it over there. And the people say, don't bring it over here. And they'd bring it over there, and all of a sudden plagues start coming around. And the people of the Philistines said, we've got to get rid of this thing. Now, what's the significance there? The significance is this. God doesn't need you and me to fight his battles. God can fight his own battles. Amen. Sometimes I think we forget and we think that God needs me to help fight his battles. No, God can fight his own battles. God, well, well I got to go down there. I got to do this. You know, I'm going to, and, and you know, I, I can't be silent. I've got, I'm going to tell you, you can be still and hold your peace and watch the Lord fight his battles. Plagues start falling on the Philistines, and they say, we got to get rid of this thing. We got to send this thing back. This thing is cursed. This thing is causing all kinds of trouble for us, and God fights his own battles. I'm going to tell you, God's not going to be held captive. God's not going to be held a prisoner. Amen. It doesn't matter what they do. The Word of God will not. Amen. Be silenced. 
2020, 2021, 22, whatever the next decade holds, whatever we're going into, I don't have to worry. The truth of God, the kingdom of God is going to march on irrespective of me, but I want to be a part of it. Amen. I want to be in the Lord's army, but if I'm not, God can fight his battle without me. Hallelujah. And if God can fight his battles without me, then that means God can fight your battles without you. Hallelujah. Oh, somebody thank the Lord today. Hallelujah. So the Lord fought the battles. The Philistines said, okay, we got to get rid of this thing. We got to send this thing back. And now we come to our text to one of the most interesting passages of scripture, I think, because the Philistines said, okay, now listen. I don't know what about them thought that this would have all just been coincidence. But they said, maybe this is just a coincidence. Maybe we got the ark and there was an earthquake we didn't feel in the middle of the night and that's why Dagon fell over. Maybe there just happened to be an outbreak of a plague everywhere we took the ark at the same time and it's just coincidence. Maybe this isn't the God Almighty. So let's do something interesting. They said, let's take the ark here of God, and let's make a new cart. And we're going to set the ark upon the cart. And uh, we're going to take two cows that have just given birth, that are uh, in, in, in a nature only concerned about their calves and nursing, and we're going to take these two cows that have never pulled a cart in their life, and we're going to yoke them together, and then we're going to take their crying little newborn baby calves, and we're going to carry them away, and we're going to lock them up so that they can hear the bleeding of their calves, and uh, we're going to take this cart. They said, we're going to make this as impossible as we can. And then we're going to step back and we're going to see what happens with the ark. And someone really wise said, if it goes back, then we'll know. This was not a coincidence, but this was the hand of the Lord And if it doesn't go anywhere and it just goes in circles, then we'll know that this was just a coincidence. Somebody say amen. Amen. Say amen again. (laughs) Y'all knew what I was doing, so I was just going to make sure you knew that I knew that you knew what I was doing. We're going to make it as impossible as it can be. And if the ark goes back, then we know that he's God. No prophet, no priest, no preacher, no servant. They set the ark up there. They take the two calves that have never been under a yoke of, uh, uh, before. They put them together. And the Bible says this. And, well, let me get there. The kind took the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh and went along the highway lowing as they went and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them unto the border of Beth Shemesh. What is it saying? It's saying the Philistines said we're going to make this as impossible as we can. And then we're going to follow along and we're going to watch and we're going to see. Here's what's interesting in this story. The ark of God was lost not by God but by man's hands. By the mishandling, by the misappropriating, by the disrespect, by the rebellion of 
people who neglected what God wanted to give them. They lost the glory of God. Where is the glory? But the glory returned, not at the hand of any man or any woman or any individual, but it came back on its own in the most improbable circumstance. It would not happen. Here comes the ark, and all of a sudden it's making a straight line. And the lords of the Philistines are amazed. Can you believe it? This must be the ark of the Lord. And the glory of the Lord went back to where the word says the glory of the Lord is going to be. What does that mean? That tells me this, that not only can God fight his own battles, but God's going to do what he said he's going to do, and he doesn't need anybody. He doesn't need anybody to help him, and ain't nobody can stop him. Ain't nothing in this world that can keep him, amen, from doing what he's going to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, there is going to be a church in the last day. There is going to be revival in the last day. The Holy Ghost is going to pour out in the last day. The Word of God is going to go forth in the last day. So what if they say, well, you can't preach it, and we're going to have to imprison it, and we're going to chain it, and we're going to stop it, and we're going to say you can't do this, and you can't do that. I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter what the world says. The glory of the Lord's going to do what it wants to do. It's going to do what it says it's going to do. The glory of the Lord comes back, and here it is in chapter number 6. We see when the glory of the Lord comes back, the Bible says, and they of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley and they lifted up their eyes and they saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. I'm going to tell you they saw the ark. You can't even imagine what happened. You can't even imagine this wasn't just a few days. This was almost a year's time. Seven months now they've lost the glory of the Lord. The ark is gone. Here we are. The high priest is dead. The ark is gone. What what are we going to do? And they looked up and they saw the ark of God coming back and the glory of the Lord return. I'm here to tell you that God's glory is coming back. But pay attention to what happened in verse 13. And here's what I want to say to you as I come to a close. It's not a coincidence. Nothing about this was coincidence. Nothing about this was an accident. The Philistines are trying to prove that it wasn't a coincidence. And it's in this event where the ark of God comes back. And when the glory of God comes back, what does it say? It says, they were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. I don't think it was a coincidence. That when the glory returns, it returns to a group of people that are working in the field. People that hadn't given up. People that hadn't quit. People that hadn't stopped. Seven months had gone by, but they still planted. Seven months had gone by, but they still went out there and weeded. Seven months had gone by, but they still watered. And seven months had gone by, and now they were coming to the harvest. They were preparing for the harvest. They were reaping. They were gathering, and they were laboring, and it was wild. While they were working that the glory of the Lord came back. It wasn't a coincidence. It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't happenstance. The ark could have gone anywhere. It could have gone to the homes that said, where is the glory that had given up? It could have gone to the graves. It could have gone to those that were silent. But it went back to those that were working. I'm here to tell somebody even when you don't feel like it, even when you can't see it, you keep believing, you keep holding on, you keep standing, you keep working. Why? Because the glory is on its way home. The glory. 
is coming back to your house. Oh, clap your hands unto the Lord. Hallelujah. As they come to the music, it's not an accident. It's not just happenstance. But the glory returns while they are working their fields of labor. I'm here to tell somebody now is not the time to bail out. Now is not the time to quit. Now is not the time to throw in the towel. Now is not the time to backslide. Now is not the time to walk away. Now is not the time to despair. Now is not the time to believe the lie of the enemy that tells you your life is not worth anything. Now is the time to keep on keeping on. It's what Paul would write in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 when he's talking about the resurrection. In verse 16 he says this, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day for our light affliction. What does he call light affliction? He calls imprisonments being beat, being left for dead, hunger, pain, nakedness. He says, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For which cause we faint not. God's faithful. And so ought we to be faithful. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't despair. Sometimes you don't feel like it. You don't feel like going on. You feel like giving up. We saw some gorgeous country in the last 16 days. Spent most of the day in the car for a few hours. It's a long way up there. Took us three days to get up there. We, we spread it out over four. It took us, would have taken us three days to get home, but we spread it out over, I think, eight. <laughs> Spent a lot of time in the car and all the gorgeous sights. Went to Custer State Park in there driving Needles Highway and all the beautiful things. If you've never been way underrated, just awesome. So we did some hiking. We took, took my wife's parents and Luca and went up the cathedral spires. I told them it's just a real short hike. It read on the thing strenuous. <laughs> it's an easy hike. Anybody can do it. We went up and we did it and it was awesome. Man, when you got to the top, it was beautiful. There were mountain goats, two baby mountain goats there in that pasture right looking at the needles or the cathedral spires. And then the next day I decided I was, it was a couple days I guess later, I decided I wanted to do a hike on my own. I was going to go to the highest peak, Black Elk Point, all by myself. Janelle said, go by yourself. So I got in the car. She said, go by yourself. That meant I need a day alone. Go, go, <laughs> get away. That's what that means after you've been in the car that No, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a hard time. And so I went to park at the, the easy trail, and it was too crowded. Couldn't find any parking spots, so I thought, I'm going to take this other trail. I took the other trail that was a little bit more steep, and then it connected to a strenuous connection trail that got to the next trail. And it was, I don't know how high up it went, but I turned my phone my phone didn't have signal and I didn't want to drain the battery and so I put it in airplane mode and I'm hiking up the mountain and I'm going up there and you can see I get to the top and I start seeing all the views and I'm higher now than Mount Rushmore and Cathedral Spires and I'm videoing as I'm walking. Sounds like I have asthma as I'm videoing as I'm walking up the, the mountain, going up there, get to the top point. <clears throat> and I get to the top and I turn... All of a sudden, I was going to call her, and I turned my phone on, and I've got incredible reception. Most of the trip, I had no reception. The whole time we were in North Dakota, I had zero reception. I'd have to go to a Wi-Fi spot to make a phone call. And, and I get to the top, incredible reception. I'm able to take pictures and videos and send them. It's like the best ever. In fact, it was weird. I opened up 
my phone, and this is how crazy it was. It was, a little, it was a little spooky. I opened up my phone after being on airplane mode, and I pulled up maps, and it told me where my rental car was parked. I thought, I don't know how that is, but this phone's too smart for us. I told my wife, we're not buying a smart car. We're, bu- we're going to buy a dumb car as long as we can. I'm holding out. And I was looking on there. Man, the reception was great. I could call anybody. I could talk to anybody. I'm going to tell you, it's like going up the mountain. You think, man, this is beautiful. This is fine. I can stop here. Or you're going up, man, there's drudgery. I, you're walking up through the meadow. And I couldn't even stop to enjoy the meadow because if I stopped, I knew I wasn't going to make it because I'm so out of shape. I was like, if I stop, I'm, I'm going to quit. I'm going to just say, this is good enough. I'm walking away. You just got to keep on going. You don't know what's ahead. You don't know what's ahead of you. You don't know what's in front of you. In life, you get to a place. This was at a critical place. This story was at one of the most desperate places. What if the last thing you had heard in your life from the man of God's family was, where is the glory? Seven months go by. What are you going to do? Where are you at? The Bible says they're still reaping. They're still laboring. They're still watering. I don't know where the ark's at. I I, I want to go back to that day where we have the presence of God. I don't know where it's at. It's over in Philistine. Someone said it. It's being taken around. Who knows what they're doing? Desecrating the things of God. But I'm just going to keep on keeping on. I'm just going to keep on believing. And all of a sudden, they look up over the horizon. And it was just another day of harvest. But when they looked up, There was the glory of God. Wow. The Bible says they began to rejoice. They began to dance. We're not even in the capital city. We're not even back there. But here is the glory of God coming back. Can I tell you, even when you don't see it, God's working. Even when you don't feel it, God's working. God's going to have a church Can I tell you, it could be that our generation is the generation upon whom the ends of the earth come and the glory of the Lord is coming back. (laughs) Jesus is going to come and the Bible says that when he comes, he'll come from the eastern sky and his feet will rest again on the Mount of Olives where he ascended up into heaven before. He will come through the eastern gate says that the mountain will be ripped in two and the Bible declares that he will go through the eastern gate in the 1500 Suleiman the Great conquered Jerusalem he did not like Christianity he did not like Judaism his faith was a different faith and to prove it he knew he knew what their prophecy was And so he went to the eastern wall. When he built that wall, Suleiman's wall is what the most prominent wall in Jerusalem. He went to the eastern gate and he blocked it up. You can see the archway, but there's no hole in there. And it it stands as a monument. Every time you go to Jerusalem, it stands as a monument that the eastern gate is not possible. Just to make sure he knew Jewish men would never defile themselves with dead bodies, he planted a grave right outside the eastern gate. They said, this is where you can go there. There's a Muslim grave right by the great, the, the, the gate where Suleiman had walled up. He did it to defy that Messiah will never come back and go through there. I'm going to tell you from the looks of it, it looks like it will never happen. But I've got a word of God right here that says I don't need anybody to fight my battles. Hey, somebody said, well, we got to go. We got we to move the grave. We got to open up the gate. I'm going to tell you, no, we don't have to do anything. God's going to do what God says he's going to do. All we've got to do is just trust and be ready and be looking for the coming of the Lord. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to, I don't want to be, I don't want to be in despair that I miss it. God's glory is coming back. And can I tell you, God's glory is here for you today, right now. 
Come on, would you stand together with me? There's healing in the house today. There's deliverance in the house today. Come on, there's faith in the house today. I'm not just preaching about the future. I'm preaching about right now. Come on, some of you, it may be physical. It may be financial. It may be spiritual. But the glory of God is here today. Would you lift up your hand? Would you lift up your knee? Would you lift up your heart? Come on, right now, can we turn this into a house of prayer? Can we turn this into a house of surrender? In the name of the Lord God, we need revival. I want revival in my heart. I want revival in my home. I want revival in my family, in my marriage, in my relationships. Come on, that's it right now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, you see your people today. And you know those, God, that are at the point of giving in, God. And here today, God, we're preaching hope and we're preaching faith. But God, it has to be more than form and function. It has to get inside of our heart and in our spirit. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, we surrender to you, God, in Jesus' name. Come on, can you do that all over this house? Come on, if you're online right now, would you just lift up your hands? Come on, just surrender to God right now. Come on, we're turning this whole place into an altar. This is a sanctuary. Come on, if you need to kneel at your pew, come on, just just whatever. Come on, we're going to turn this into a house of prayer for a few moments. Come on, the glory of the Lord is coming back. Come on, I don't want to miss it. Hallelujah. Come on, the Holy Ghost is here for you today. Come on. Even when I don't see your word. Oh, yes, Lord. Even when I Come on, the Holy Ghost is here for you today. You never stop. Come on, the you Holy Ghost is here working. right now. You never Come on, somebody stop. repent. You somebody open up. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never.
In the name of Jesus, that is who you are. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I want Brother Kendall to come, and I'm going to ask him to lead us in prayer. Amen. There are things that we don't know about that happen that are going on, not only in our world, but in our life personally. And as we pray, God, I I don't want to faint. I don't want to give up. But I want to not be weary and well-doing, but I want to keep on keeping on. Amen. I want Brother Kendall to pray a prayer of faith right now over every circumstance. Can we join together right now? Our heart, God, can you just say yes? Let there be an amen in your spirit. If you're online today, whatever the need is, amen. God's glory is here. Amen. We don't have to wait, amen, for the Lord to return before His Spirit can come inside of our heart right now. The glory of God can be at work in your life. Come on, would you just stretch forth your faith right now in any way as He leads us in prayer. Hallelujah. Over every Lord, home, every in the name individual. of Jesus, would you lift up your hands and lift up your voice unto the Lord? Hallelujah, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray over every life today, God, every need in this house, Lord. I pray, oh God, that we would yield everything in our life to you today, Lord. God, we yield every circumstance to you. We yield every situation to you, God. We surrender everything to you, Lord, and we put our faith and our hope and our trust in you, Lord. And God, we know that we walk by faith and not by sight. And Lord, I pray that you would give faith today, Lord. I pray that you would strengthen our faith today. Let faith arise in our hearts today, oh God. Lord, that we trust in you, Lord, and God, that in every circumstance, in every situation, in every trial, God, Lord, we believe and we know that you are working on our behalf, oh God, and that you fight on our behalf, Lord. You fight our battles for us today, and so, Lord, we don't work out our own situation, God, but we trust in you, Lord, and we put it in your hands today, oh God, and we wait upon you, Lord, today, oh Oh, I pray, Lord, let us wait upon you and let us be bound together with you, Lord. And God, I pray, let us walk in the Spirit, Lord, and let us walk in the power of the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, I pray, oh, Lord, let it be so today. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, would you lift up a praise unto the Lord right now? Blessed be your name today, oh God. We worship you, Lord. In Jesus' name. In the church said amen. amen. Somebody say amen. Amen, amen, amen. I want to be an encourager today. I want to be an encourager to somebody. Amen. To turn to somebody and tell them you can make it. Come on. God's working on your ha- on your behalf. God's working for you. Amen. Amen. God is working for you. Amen. God's working for you, Brother Zarita. Amen. Are you encouraged by the Lord, His goodness, His faithfulness? Amen. I'm encouraged by the power of the Holy Ghost. God is so faithful. And it's so good, so good to be back home. So good to see you all in the house of the Lord. I want to say thank you for doing your part, helping us out here uh, with registration and social distancing and all of that stuff. I know it's frustrating and, and, and we want to get over that. But as things are happening and going forward, we're just doing our part, not only to do be wise and diligent, but also to be a good witness too as well. So thank you, Brother Charles. I know all of our medical workers that are on the front lines. Amen. We're praying for them. Remember those that are sick, this week on Tuesday night, we'll have prayer. If you haven't been to a prayer yet, join me Tuesday night in prayer. Thank you, Sister Dawn, for keeping our weekly prayer growing. Prayer makes the difference. Now, we don't have Sunday night service 
like we have been having it. So that gives you another evening to come to prayer. Amen. And then Wednesday night, I haven't been here for four Wednesday nights. I haven't spoken for four Wednesday nights. And I had a message ready four Wednesday nights ago. And right before I was walking out of the office, we got the unfortunate news that my pastor's wife passed away. And I just couldn't do it. So I'm going to be teaching this week on the work of holiness Wednesday night. So if you can be here uh, or tune in online, it's going to be great. And uh, tonight at 6 o'clock for all of our young people. Divorce care class is going on Thursday night. Thank you to Sister Lakely. We have some small groups starting up as well. I'm excited about things that are happening. God's, amen, church is growing, and I'm glad to be a part of it. We love you. Amen. We're going to dismiss all of those right now. Uh, please, if you want to stay around in fellowship, I ask you just to stay at your seats and let those that want to be dismissed safely, amen, they can be. God bless you. We love you. And you're dismissed in Jesus' name. We hope to see you soon.